I'm filming this this morning for the benefit of people who would have liked to have been here or remember George Mash and they're not able to because they're all part of their own fellowships and so on. As I was thinking of how I'm going to introduce this to a church that relatively doesn't necessarily know about this man, when I was wandering around the church I noticed that on the, the board there, the, the memorial, it's written, she being dead yet speaketh. This is a passage that comes from Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4. That passage was used in one of four sermons which were preached at Dean Church to remember this man George Mash because of the importance of his legacy. Now you may think, well, why have a memorial to a man who died 460 years ago this very year and was born 500 years ago this very year? Well, because the Reformation. Now, the Reformation is everything that we stand for today. I could say pretty much everything that you do today is a product of the Reformation. The very fact that we are meeting today as a free congregation is because of the Reformation. The very fact that you can think freely is a product of the Reformation. The very fact that we have many translations of the Bible is a product of the Reformation. The very fact that we can boldly declare that the Bible is the Word of God and that we believe it is the sole rule of practice for faith and belief is a product of the Reformation. But it didn't come without a fight. Many people lost their lives as a product of this Reformation. They lost their lives so that we may have ours. Because the Reformation in itself didn't just happen at one period of time in the 16th century. The Reformation happened for a furtherance. It happened for an establishment. The very fact that we have Sola Scriptura, which is by Scripture alone, is a product of the Reformation. The very fact that we have Sola Fide, which is by faith alone in Jesus Christ, and the very fact that we have sola gratia by grace alone is a product of the Reformation and a product of what these people stood for. This man, George Mash, much of what we know about him comes from the book, The Fox's Book of Martyrs. This book, The Fox's Book of Martyrs, was produced by a man named John Fox. He was an Oxford scholar. He was a great man and he too was an exile from this country during the persecutions that Mary the first, who you may know as Mary Tudor, inflicted upon the Christian community and they were exiled out of this country and went to Geneva or Germany. He began to produce this work in 1552, it took him about 31 years to produce. The last edition of it was published in 1583. He gives quite a good spread upon this man, George Mash, and that's where our source comes from. He never charged any money for this edition either. He produced his work, put everything into it, unfathomable amount of research into this whole book, which consists of about 2,300 pages, thereabouts in the originals, and yet he never charged a penny for it. He never made a penny. He lived in poverty all of his life. So, George Mash, this man, what do we know about him? Well, his importance lies in the fact that he was not only a man who gave his life for the gospel, that he was executed. He stood alone amongst the ridicule of others, amongst his friends, his family, telling him to recant or leave the country. He didn't. He stayed here. He was a friend of a man named John Bradford, he was a profound reformer. He was born here in Manchester. And because of his faith in the gospel, he too was burned alive at the stake. He was also a friend of James Pokington, the Bishop of Durham, who had also contributed to the Book of Common Prayer, which was very influential in the, in the Protestant Reformation, the 39 Articles, which likewise were, and the Book of Homilies. His dean was the 
a man named William Whittingham, who was the translator of the Geneva Bible, which you may have heard of, you may not have. That Geneva Bible was profoundly influential in the Protestant Reformation and even in the founding of America, because that Geneva Bible was taken when the Puritans of the 17th century left this country and went to America at New Plymouth, they took the Geneva Bible with them. It was the foundation of the America that we know today. And his mother, William Mertingham, was born in Chorley. These were all people who were associated with this man, George Marsh. William Mertingham was also the brother-in-law of John Calvin, the French and Genevan reformer, who the whole of Europe is affected by his reformation. And here we have John Fox giving us this information on George Marsh. So what do we know about George Marsh? Well, this is his story. George Marsh was born in Dean in Bolton in 1515. He was born into a family of farmers. His father was named George Marsh by some accounts and that he was named after him. We don't know an awful lot about the childhood of George Marsh other than the fact that he was raised as a farmer. We know that there is a community of Protestants in that area of Dean, which is in Bolton, not too far from here, and that this Protestant Reformation which occurred, of which I'll give you the history of in, in, a, in a brief form. Henry VIII, who we all know quite a lot about, or we've all heard a lot about, reformed the church in England and separated from Rome. Before Henry VIII, the church in this country was dominated by the Roman Catholic Church. Everything was monitored by the Roman Catholic Church. Everything that you did was monitored by them. You had to have a license to preach. And if you didn't obey what they had given as doctrine, you could not preach. You could certainly not establish a church or plant a church back in those days. These aspects and this totality of the Roman Catholic Church was challenged by a number of individuals over the centuries. John Wycliffe in 1388 produced a New Testament, the very first New Testament in English. He produced from the Latin Vulgate, which was the Latin Vulgate was the dominant translation of the Bible for a thousand years. This influence that John Wycliffe had travelled on from centuries up to John Huss, who was also likewise burned at the stake, right through to the 16th century, when a man named William Tyndale, who was very influential in the Roman Catholic Church and in the, Refor in the Reformation, in 1521-1522, he was in a debate with a clergyman and this is how far the Roman Catholic Church had gone at that time. The clergyman said to Tyndale, I don't care what the Bible says, this is my paraphrase, if it contradicts what the Pope says. I don't care about the commandments of God. I care more about what the Pope says than what God says. If God contradicts the Pope, I care more for the Pope. William Tyndale boldly and profoundly stood and said, I defy the Pope and all his laws. And if God spares my life here many years, I will cause the boy that driveth the plough to know more of the scripture than thou dost. When he said this, George Marsh was about seven years old and he was being trained to drive the plough. There can be a little doubt, in my mind at least, that George Marsh was one of the ploughboys that William Tyndale prophesied about. George Marsh was a lover of God at that point. And he was very studious and inquisitive concerning learning and reading and studying. We don't know an awful lot about the rest of his life at this point. <coughs> what we do know, however, is that as a product of the Reformation, he was freely allowed to be married. Because, believe it or not, there are many pastors, elders, deacons, and so forth in the church today who would not be permitted to marry if not for the Reformation. In 1540, when Marsh was 25 years old, he married a local girl of the county of Dean. 
This girl is described as an honest maiden, which is a, a great compliment for the 16th century. George Marsh refers to her as loving and faithful. They had a successful and happy marriage, and they had several children. But at some point here, probably about eight or nine years after George Marsh married this girl, of whom we know nothing about, we don't know her name, we don't know how old she was, we don't know what she thought, what she looked like, we know nothing about her. She died. We don't even know what she died of. At this, it obviously distraught George. And soon after, the reports say that he left Dean and went to the University of Cambridge to continue on in his study of godly matters. God was working in George Marsh to bring him to a place where he would have never have been brought unless his wife had died. That might sound cruel, but God sees the larger picture, at least by the 16th century. Marsh never viewed this point, this event to have actually been something that happened by mere chance, as people might say today. Some people might just say today, these things happen. Well, Marsh stated that this happened by God. He stated, I thought myself now of late years for the cares of this life well settled with my loving and faithful wife and children. But the Lord, who worketh all things for the best to them that love him, would not there leave me, but did take my dear and beloved wife from me, whence death was a painful cross to my flesh. Marsh went to the University of Cambridge and there he studied theology, which in the 16th century was regarded as the queen of sciences. He soon became welcomed and loved by the Protestant community there, and he became a curate or a deacon and a school teacher to a man named Lawrence Sanders. Lawrence Sanders was a profound reformer in the 16th century, and Marsh was his curate for a time. This seemed to be like a good time for him. He'd been raised in Bolton, a successful farmer, had his own property, his own farm, gone to university after the death of his wife, but suddenly something happened in England. Because Henry VIII had separated from the Church of Rome, Edward VI, who was the king at that time, was Henry VIII's son, but he died in July 1553. At that time, Mary was to be brought back to the throne as she was to be Queen of England. And she wanted to undo what her father did and re-establish the relationship between the Church of England and the Roman Catholic Church. And she was prepared to get it. She went on a rampage from 1553 to 1558, slaughtering and putting too many Christians on trial for their testimony of the word of God and not the testimonies of the Pope or the traditions of the church, but of scripture itself. Some 288 or 300 Protestants were executed during her reign. What happened next in the story of George Marsh is uh, somewhat mysterious. It seems that he returned to Lancashire, he returned to this area to preach at Eccles, Dean, Bury and Bolton to profoundly warn the church that Antichrist was coming back. The Antichrist was going to take over and to warn the churches not merely for political reasons, but to warn the churches not to conform to this foul doctrine of the Pope. The authorities picked up on this. The Earl of Derby, who was a very powerful man at the time, picked up on this and sent out a warrant to Master Barton, the, the, the sheriff at Smithles Hall, to find George Marsh and bring him to himself to stand trial 
Master Barton at Smithills Hall gave orders to his servants and said, George Marsh, the preacher, is back and you will find this Protestant, you will find this Lollard, this Bible believing Christian, you will find him and bring him to me at once or your own carcass will answer for his. But George Marsh wasn't there. His servants had made diligent searches for him in Bolton. He wasn't there. He was with his mother. We don't know anything about his father at that point because it seems as though his father died. He was with his aged mother and upon hearing about this he didn't want to bring any charges to his family. He didn't want to bring any trouble to his family. So he departed right away and made his way up to Dean Church. Dean Church, you can visit this place today, it still stands, and there's little areas which I regularly visit of where he wandered about during that time. If you will, it was his Garden of Gethsemane, where the trial was about to come upon him. He knew what was to come upon him. Shameful death, to be burned alive at the stake, your family to be tormented, your family to be hunted down, your property to be seized by the authorities. He knew this. So he left and went to Dean Church. There he stayed all night in turmoil. During my time of um, producing this documentary and researching this man, I've spent a number of amount of time up in that area, wandering around. I even spent the evening up there in the dark. And it's the type of place, although it's very beautiful, it's the type of place where you could feel like the devil was sat on your shoulder tempting you. And of course you can imagine, can't you, of your own life, of your own family saying, just leave. Don't stand up to this, just leave the country, flee. Which he had intended to do, he had intended to go to Germany where he could be amongst Luther and the reformers. But he knew in his conscience that God was calling for him to boldly declare the faith of Christ and to not be told that he had to flee or that he couldn't believe. He knew by the strength of the Holy Spirit that he needed to stay and boldly declare the faith of Christ. That evening he spent, he spent in turmoil and if you can get the picture of this, he was alone, completely alone. Everybody was saying something else to him. Everybody was saying, recant or leave. Don't believe in scripture alone. Believe in the Pope. Or just conform. Just recant now and repent later. God will forgive you. All these comforting words people no doubt said to him. His family wanted him to leave. But he wouldn't. There alone, up by Dean Moore and up at Dean Church, he wasn't left alone. God, by his Holy Spirit, sent a good Christian man to him and he met with him. He comforted him and they spent time in prayer. And in the evening he went over to his friend's house and there he stayed. In the morning he awoke and said his prayers as he usually did every morning and every evening from the Book of Common Prayer. And one of his close friends came to visit him in the morning with a letter from one of his friends. This letter said what he already knew in his conscience, that you should not flee, but abide and boldly confess the faith of Jesus Christ. Marsh already knew this in his conscience and so, he prepared himself for the trial that was to come upon him, just for believing the Word of God. Marsh revisited his friends and his family and his mother, and he went to see his children. He describes in his account how there was many tears shed at that point, even from himself. And he looked at his children 
knowing that they would never see him again. He cried and they cried and they said goodbye. That very evening Marsh made his way to Smithles Hall where he was to stand before Master Barton to give an account. At his trial or supposed trial at Smithles Hall Barton showed George a letter and said this is from the Earl of Derby. You are to appear before him being accused of preaching without a license, being accused of laying out boldly the Protestant faith and this same essence that John Wycliffe taught so many years ago Scripture alone is the final rule of faith. You are appear to appear before the Earl of Derby the following day. The Earl of Derby resided at a place called Latham, which is in near Ormskirk. He was a very powerful man. But Marsh's concerns at this point, which is what I really like about him, his concerns were not for himself. He said, to Master Barton that his friends, his brothers, his brother, singular, and his family had to stay behind because Barton at that point wanted George Marsh to go to Latham to stand the trial but to take the family with him, that his family needed to escort him there. But Marsh's concerns were for their farm because back in those days if if a farmer lost one year's worth of crops and didn't lay the crops at the right point, then you'd lose the whole season and your whole family could die because there was no other way of feeding them. Marsh appealed to Barton that they might be able to stay to continue on with the farming, but nothing could be obtained. Now there's a tradition that uh, Smithles Hall that Marsh stomped his foot upon the ground. But this tradition itself only dates back to 1787. The original accounts of John Fox go much earlier, so I'm not going to continue with that line of thought. I don't think it fits with the narrative. Plus, it's somewhat of a ridiculous myth to think that you can stamp your foot upon the ground and the concrete remains keeps an imprint. So, George Marsh left here with his brother and with William Marsh and headed to Latham where he was to stand trial for this, for the Eucharist. The fact that the Roman Catholic Church declared that the bread and the wine was the literal body and blood of Jesus Christ. So in other words, what the Mass was teaching, which is a, a fallacy, is essentially cannibalism and vampirism because it's declaring that by a miracle by some kind of act of divine power, the bread and the wine is miraculously turned into the actual flesh of Jesus Christ and the actual blood of Jesus Christ. And oh yes, mark my words, the Roman Catholic Church still believes this to this day. But it doesn't have any history in it. The early church fathers knew nothing about this because it wasn't there. The earliest actual declaration of this dates back to 1215 at the Lateran Council in Rome. But people like the reformers were willing to die for this because it wasn't scriptural. So he stood trial at Latham House on his own and he was questioned and they said to him, what is your name? Marsh, he replied. What did you do for a living? They asked him. He says, I was a minister, served as a cure, and taught the school. They had previously asked him if he was a priest, and he replied, no. And they said to themselves, this is a strange thing. First, this man declares himself to be a priest. Now he says he isn't one. Marsh said, by the laws now used in this realm, I am none. 
They asked him who gave them the orders and he said the Bishop of London and Lincoln, which at the time was a man named Nicholas Ridley, who was also to be executed at the stake. They asked him what his beliefs were. Marsh replied, I believe in God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, according as the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments do teach. They took him and they flung him in a cell, which was the first time he'd ever been in prison, in a cold, windy stone house where there was little room, and there he lay for three nights without any bed, with meat and drink served twice a day. Then they called him up for service again, to stand trial. There he boldly declared his faith in the word of God. And they gave him a book. They gave him a book to read. They couldn't give him the Bible because they couldn't answer the questions. They couldn't answer the statements that he put forth about the clear exposition of scripture. They gave him a book by a Spanish friar named Alphonsus. This book was in defense of the Roman Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation, which is that the literal, the, ble the bread and wine is the actual literal um, body and blood of Jesus Christ. But this is what I love about these ancient reformers. He's in jail and what does he do? He asks for a pen and paper, or they give him a pen and paper, and he writes an absolute defense of the gospel to them in writing. They give him a book, he reads the whole book, and then he writes a thesis against the book while he's in jail. I love that. I really love that. Because did he murmur about himself? No. He boldly declared that his suffering was to come to advance the gospel. They couldn't come to a conclusion at that trial and they didn't have the authority to execute him. So they sent him to Lancaster Castle. Now Lancaster Castle is still there to this day and it even bears the hallmarks of a man named John of Gaunt, who was John Wycliffe's friend, who saved John Wycliffe at one of these trials. And yet today, when Marsh was taken in there, he was taken through the very gate which has the image of John of Gaunt on there. There Marsh stayed at that cell and in prison for up to seven to nine months where he was tried a number of times. We don't know exactly how many times he was tried. There he suffered greatly being chained up with irons at his feet, being chained up with criminals, thieves and robbers. And goodness knows what people were doing to be flung into that place. There he spent seven to nine months in jail for the gospel. But he did some very interesting and beautiful things from this place. He had the habit, according to the Book of Common Prayer, to read with a loud voice prayers in the morning and in the evening. Because throughout all of his trials, what I love about George Marsh is he never ceased from prayer and he never ceased from the reading of scripture or the proclamation of the gospel. In his cell, there was a window. And from this window, people began to gather outside to listen to the scriptures being read in English and to listen to them praying because at some point he was given a cell with a man named Warburton. We don't know who he was. They were both reading scripture and praying from their cell every day. And the people came from all over Lancaster to hear them reading the scriptures from their cells out, right outside the jail. Now that's a beautiful way of getting the gospel out. And you can think, well, you know, you could be in jail fighting for your rights and to say, I demand a new trial. I'm an innocent man. George Marsh was not an innocent man because he believed the gospel, which according to the laws at that time was absolutely illegal. This area where, where the, the jail was, I think I've located it. It's in Adrian's Tower in Lancaster Castle. 
and the exact spot of where the jail was is overlooking the church and it seems as though when the church services were continuing on and people were walking past this church past the cell where he was originally kept it was on the, the window will have been on street level the scriptures were being nakedly read out in Tyndale's translation from that very cell as they were going into the Latin Mass in the church. <coughs> if you visit that place, you can see the ex exactly what I'm saying. He was doing what he was doing right in the face of the church, but it wasn't defiant. He was just merely obeying his priestly duties because a priest in those days was to read scripture and pray from the book of prayer every morning and, and every evening. But this was not to continue on. The Bishop of Chester, Dr. Coates, had heard that this preacher, this Bible-believing Christian, was doing this from his cell. He came from Chester to perform his ceremonies at the church at Lancaster. And Marsh knew that he was coming, and Marsh somehow describes that he was giving this idolatrous, blasphemous um, ceremony of holy water, the sprinkling of infants. And he, the bishop came to Lancaster and found out that George Marsh was doing what he was doing, that he was preaching from the cell. So he said, well, I'll put a stop to that. He got in touch with the, the jailer at Lancaster Castle and he no doubt gave him a throttling and said to him that he's not to have this kind of freedom. Marsh had had friends coming to him and visiting him while he was in jail from his own hometown and from the churches where he was very familiar with. And some of them have probably given the jailer some money to make Marsh's time a little bit more comfortable. The bishop put an end to that and took him from Lancaster after the seven to nine months that he'd been there and took him back to Chester to stand trial yet again. There would be the final trial that George Marsh would have. He took him to Chester and there Marsh would stand trial at Chester Cathedral in the Lady Chapel. This would be a much more bigoted hardcore trial than he, he had had before. Because he had previously had his trial at Latham, and because he would previously had his trials at Lancaster, and he wasn't recanting, he wasn't bowing the knee. This was to be a much more fierce trial. But still, there was no opening for reason. There was no opening for scripture to be laid out nakedly, no. What there was, was a barrage of insults to be given to Marsh, calling him a diseased sheep, telling people, don't stand near him, lest you become infected by him. The bishop couldn't do anything more than conform to insults to this man. And what for? For believing the Bible, for believing that Jesus was the way to heaven, Believing that the Bible is the divine revelation of God and not the authority of the Pope. For believing that the Eucharist, which so many Christians take advantage for, was not the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ, but was a symbolic act done in remembrance of him, by which we proclaim his resurrection until he comes. By this time, George had had over maybe a, up to a year's worth of suffering. No bath, no haircut, no shave, no change of clothes. He may have even been beaten at that point. Nourished, depriving of being nourished of food because they didn't give good food. He stood trial at Chester Cathedral before the bishop. Dr. Coates. 
And I'll move directly to the, to the final parts of the trial. If you can get the picture here, your life is on the line. Everything that you've ever known was about to end. Your whole mortal life is about to come to an end, unless you bow the knee. People came to Marsh at that point and said, recant. Just recant of your beliefs. People were coming from the crowd, pulling at his sleeve. But he couldn't. He said, I would as sane live as any of you, if in doing so I would not deny my Master Christ, and he deny, my, and he deny me before his Father in heaven. The Chancellor asked him how he pleaded. Because he had been accused of preaching nakedly from the scriptures in these parishes of Dean, Berry, Bolton and Eccles the previous year, Marsh never denied any of these charges. Marsh replied to this, to this plea how he pleaded. He said, I have neither heretically nor blasphemously preached or spake against any of the said articles but simply and truly, as occasion served, as it were thereunto forced in conscience, maintain the truth, touching the same articles, as all you now present did acknowledge in the same time as the late King Edward VI. All those people that were at that trial believed exactly the same thing as he did when Edward was in power. But now, now Mary was in power, no, they suddenly bowed the knee. Is this not a picture of the Christian church? Of how cowardly it can sometimes be when the pressure is put on? I put myself in that position many times and I think, what would it be? Even your own family will tell you to calm down. Even your own kids will just tell you, can't you just calm down a little bit? Even the church would not like it. But there was always these few people, these true Christians, who always came up and comforted him and prayed for him and exhorted him to carry on. Dr. Coates insulted Marsh a number of times during this trial, this trial calling him a scabbed and diseased sheep. A member of the council spoke and said to Marsh that he denied the Bishop of Rome's authority in England. Would you also insult every Pope? Marsh said, no. There were some popes who were good men. But he claimed that they had no more authority in England than the Archbishop of Canterbury had in Rome. With this place, neither have I spoke against the person of the bishop, but against his doctrine, which in most points is repugnant to the doctrine of Christ. There was nothing personal in this. There was no attacks against his person. There was no attacks against the person of the Pope. This was a doctrinal matter. This wasn't personal. Upon Marsh saying this, Bishop Dr. Coates responded, Thou art an arrogant fellow indeed. In what article of the do is the doctrine of the Church of Rome repugnant to the doctrine of Christ? Marsh replied, O oh my Lord, I pray you judge not so of me. I stand now upon the point of my life and death, and a man in my case has no cause to be arrogant, neither am I. God is my record. As concerning this disagreement with this doctrine, among many other things, the Church of Rome earth on the sacrament, whereas Christ, in the institution thereof, did as well deliver the cup as the bread, saying, Drink of this. And Mark also reported, that they drank of it in like manner, St. Paul delivered it unto the Corinthians. And in the same sort was it used in the primitive church, the space of many hundreds of years. Now the church of Rome does take away one part from the sacrament. Wherefore, if I could be persuaded in my conscience by God's words that it were well done, I could gladly yield at this point. These are Marsh's words.
Dr. Colts responded, there is no disputing with a heretic. Marsh was not guilty of hate speech, nor had he insulted anybody. He was an absolute testimony to the word of God and to the pure meaning of it. At this point, the trial became furious. People came up to Marsh, pulling him, pulling his sleeve, saying, just recant, for shame, man, save thy life. Recant now and repent later. Marsh responded, I would have sane live as any of you, if in doing so I should not deny my master Christ, and so again, he should deny me before his father in heaven. At his saying this, the bishop had asked him, what say you? Will you recant? Marsh's reply caused the bishop to read out his sentence. The bishop had already read out his sentence a number of times, but the chancellor stopped him and said, no, 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 I pray you, my Lord, do not read out this sentence because if you read it out to the end, it will be too late to recall it. Every time the chancellor had said that to him, the bishop turned to Marsh and said, what sayest thou? Will thou recant? When Marsh said he would say and live as any of you, if in doing so, I would not deny my master Christ and he deny me before his father in heaven, the bishop read out the sentence in full. We don't know what that sentence actually stated, but it will have said, by order of Queen Mary, this day, you have been found guilty as a heretic and you will be taken and burned alive at the stake until you are dead. From here, Marsh was taken from the Lady Chapel in Chester Cathedral, who still to this day do not want anything to do with George Marsh. There is no mention of him there. He was taken out of the Lady Chapel towards his cell and his late keeper, who had kept him at the North Gate, where he was flung into the dungeon, cried, farewell, good George. He was taken to his cell, to what's known as the dead man's cell. This can be still found in some remains to this day at the North Gate in Chester, which was built, the, 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 the structure which remains there now is the 19th century, but the original medieval gate had a dungeon in it which was 30 feet below the ground. There Marsh remained to await his execution. A pipe had been dug into the walls so that the inmate could have oxygen because there was no light in that cell. The door, when shut, blocked out everything. Utter darkness was in that place. But some faithful Christians had come to the wall and spoke to him through the pipe and asked him how he was doing. Marsh replied that he was doing fine and that he'd ask God for the grace to not faint under his cross. On the April 24, 1555, the authorities of the city and the sheriffs and a number of barbers came to take George Marsh out of his cell to burn him alive. He was escorted from the North Gate through the streets of Chester about a mile outside the city centre to a place called Borton and Gallows Hill. There a stake was being prepared and the wood was being prepared for his execution. There was also boiling in a barrel or to be poured into a barrel hot pitch and tar which was to be poured upon his head just before he was set alight. He was taken to this place, and on his way, what did he do? He read his Tyndale New Testament all the way. Because he'd spent, of what I think, he'd spent such a long time in that cell in darkness. The first thing that he could do when he got out of the cell was to open up the scriptures and read them. People came by offering him money 
as he was walking to his execution so that they, he could give the money to the priests so that they could say masses for him after he was dead. Marsh said, keep the money. And if you're so willing, give it to the poor. He was taken to his place of execution and it was a windy day. He began to exhort the people to hold fast to Christ. But he was quickly stopped from preaching. And the man said, George Marsh, we must have no preaching now. And so he began to undress down to his outer shirt to prepare himself. And then he was fastened to the stake. Wood piled around him very poorly. And suddenly the wind began to blow. Hot pitch and tar was poured upon his head. And the fire was set. The wind came and blew, and people no doubt thought that that was a sign that this was condemned by God because the wind was putting the fire out at the same time as it was burning him. He suffered for between 20, 40 minutes long because they had deliberately made the fire not burn correctly by using poor wood and little amounts of it and we can see from the earliest images that it can be derived from that that some of the fire was put around at the back of him and little amounts were put underneath him so they would keep adding fire to him making him burn longer he had previously been given an opportunity to recant they had brought a pardon to him from Mary to say that if, if he would conform the execution would not go ahead. But he read it and said that he couldn't accept it under that condition because it would pluck him from God. Oh, he had had the chance to recant. And so he suffered 20 to 40 minutes with no murmuring whatsoever. All the other accounts, or many of the other accounts that John Fox writes about, all describe people under torment being screaming and crying or some of them saying put more fire on I don't burn that easily some people even recanted on in when they were being burnt but John Fox describes that Marsh was silent during this tribulation and the earliest image show him like shows him like this with his arms out in a manner of prayer Just at the point of his death, Marsh cried out, Father of heaven, have mercy upon me. By this he was quoting the prayer from the Sunday morning from the Book of Common Prayer, which said, Father of heaven, have mercy upon us. He was taking that prayer and continuing on in prayer right up until the very end. But he was taking it upon himself. He died. People said he died like a martyr. Upon hearing this, the bishop became angry because the last thing he wanted was a martyr for this cause. So he went to the cathedral and preached a damning sermon against George Marsh and said that he was a heretic and died like one. But his followers, or his friends, took his ashes and laid them in the ground at a local leper colony. This to me displays somewhat of the life of Christ. That even to the point of death, George had been associated with Christ even down to the lepers. Being taken outside the city walls to be executed. It shows somewhat of the life of Christ in this man and indeed I would say in all the reformers. Today, George Marsh is still somewhat remembered like services like this where we still remember him and the political authorities have taken the book of martyrs and localized it in many ways because back from the 16th century onwards 
to even to the 19th century. The Book of Martyrs was produced right the way through England, even through to America, defining how the reformers viewed the Roman Catholic Church. Today there is a great attempt to reunite the Roman Catholic Church again with the Christian community in England, with ecumenicalism, interfaith movements, and even the Church of England trying to attempt to reunite with Rome again. But we can't. There can be no such thing. Not because of what Rome has done, because people today are not responsible for what happened in the 16th century. To claim that would be a fallacy. But no, because of doctrine. You need to know what the Bible says. And when you know what the Bible says, if persecution does come, because mark my words, it will. Because if God is to restore his church in this country, he will use persecution to do it. Because he never brought about any reform. He never brought about any growth of the church, even in the earliest days, without persecution. And persecution still happens in this day. There are more Christians being executed for the faith today, probably, than any other time in history. We need to know what the Bible says. And we need to know that if persecution ever came upon us, which we don't desire it, like George, I would like to live as much as any man if in doing so I should not deny my Master Christ. But if these people didn't suffer, today you would not have a church like this. There would be no independent churches. Baptist movement would be out. Forget the Baptist church. Forget the Methodist church. Forget the Arminian church. Forget the Calvinist church. Forget the Lutherans. Forget all the denominations of Christianity, of which there are around 30,000 denominations in Christianity which has come forth since the Reformation. Forget them all. If the authorities had had their way, there would have been one church, the Roman Catholic Church. Now, I'm not anti-Catholic. I'm not attacking Roman Catholics. They're not responsible for what happened. And most Roman Catholics today would be, would be disgusted by what, what happened. Some of them, anyway. But the Pope has since apologised for these things, or asked for forgiveness. But really, it's not the Pope's place to ask for forgiveness for something that happened in the 16th century. What it is our duty to do is to learn from these things. And to learn that the true faith of the Reformers, and the true faith of the Christians, even in the New Testament, were to stand fast, even during a time of persecution. Don't lose hope. Don't despair, because this life is only part of the picture. If we all die today, glory would be waiting for us in the resurrection. But by burning George Marsh and by burning the martyrs, they thought they were ridding them of the resurrection. That's why they burned John Wycliffe when they dug him up. He dug his bones up long after he had died and burnt them and sent them down into the River Swift. And the poets have wonderfully described that event of when John Wycliffe's bones at Lutterworth were sent into the River Swift, they went down to the Avon and they went forth out into the seas and out into the wider world, thus giving rise for the scriptures to be spread out before the people. People today, never forget the suffering that the martyrs have gone through for what you have and what I have. Never forget this. Never forget the likes of George Marsh and Thomas Cranmer and Nicholas Ridley and many people who you've probably never heard of. But don't just let these words just go into your minds today and go home and switch the television on or eat your dinner and just forget this. Because you owe. You owe something. The continual debt to Christians who have suffered throughout the years for what we're about to do for having the bread and the wine. Amen.